Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry, we're running a few minutes late here. That was my fault. Um, but uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, this is uh, we'll, today. We'll be discussing uh, the left in fiction. Uh, this is kind of in addition to the last stream the four of us did um, uh, about a month ago, um, and also just uh, the distributors. Um, and not his most recent video now, but his second most recent video, I think, uh, the one on Dr. Horrible Single on Blog. That made me think about this topic a bit. Um, I actually, just before doing this, was um, was watching that about an hour ago, um, the, the the actual show, not the, uh, the distributist's video. Um, so yeah, just uh, that that has been making me think about this topic a bit. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that, I mean, it's probably incredibly dated at this stage. That's a piece of nerd culture that could really only come from 2008 and 2009. Uh, it it feels probably horribly dated and horribly cute. I imagine a rewatching. I, I the last time I rewatched that thing was about three years ago, and I felt this. I felt that way about it. I can't imagine it translates well into our time, but it was a big deal at the time due to the writer's strike. Um, and and it does sort of, it does sort of capture that 2008 feeling that. Uh, you know, if you if only the nerds were more prominent, then all of the all society's problems would be solved. Hmm. You know, we're the we're the underappreciated people in all of this. That, that, um, that's actually a funny point. I I never really thought about that. That like gamers rise up was a left wing thing, and they were actually serious about it. In two thousand eight, two thousand nine, it certainly was. And I mean, those this, this is the era of the Big Bang Theory. Of I mean, it was basically nerd everything back then. Um, but it's, uh, it's, um, you know, <laughs> sorry, I have a baby in the background. Uh, it, it basically, yeah, it, it, that's why I think Gamergate was a blow to them is mm -hmm. they felt that post 2012, that this, this culture they had designed, they felt it was more or less autonomously left wing, like say for instance, the LGBTQ whatever culture, where just by its own volition, it would consistently generate new progressive issues to run after. But as I think Gamergate showed, uh, because of the demographic makeup of the gamer and nerd community, there were huge limitations to that. And the, their cooperation with the left was really only extended insofar as the left was feeding them flattery. That's really interesting. I had never thought of uh, Gamers Rise Up as a left-wing phenomenon before, but uh, I suppose it was. And I mean, I remember, I guess, feeling this uh, desire myself, you know, way back then, uh, like when I was still a teenager to like uh, not be the outcast. Uh, and of course, you know, back then I was more of just a, a normie liberal type of person. I had never seen, um, what was it called? Dr. Horrible Singalong blog, but I did see the guild. And thinking yeah, about- Yeah, almost the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, so thinking about the guild now, um, it's been like probably like five, eight years, maybe even 10 since I've seen it. Um, and from what I can remember, it's just kind of intentionally cringe, and it's probably even more cringy now to watch. Well, it's um, got Will Wheaton in it for, I mean, it, you know, I mean, this is this is where we are right now with this, right? I mean, Will Wheaton is a highly political figure at this stage. He was not in 2006. Yes, yeah, so, so in, in 2006, they're sort of, yearning to be important members of society and now they are so the left the the gamers have risen up and things haven't gotten any better in fact they've really only gotten worse um but the um the left wing the the nerds they still act like they're the outcasts even though kind of everyone knows it's you know it's cool to be nerdy now it's not cool to be you know the jock anymore if you're if you're a millennial it's cool to be some you know person interested in atheism and neil degrasse tyson and you, you you're a gamer and you you like marvel movies and stuff so they have all of the cultural power now but they're they're still trapped in this mindset as if they're the underdog it's like they have a permanent view of themselves as the underdog and and really um they they feel good thinking that they like being the underdog and i think that's why they refuse to see that they're not because their entire like uh, raison d'etre would uh disappear if they weren't the underdog anymore this is a and i'm sure this will come up but i want to give people a chance to speak this is something that has been a consistent pernicious feature and failing of left-wing media is their ability to construct a left-wing narrative that feels at all natural when they're not contriving themselves as being the underdog, which is becoming in, in present day in particular. And we'll see how this plays out post. I mean, we're, we're at a very 
sort of funny because we're at a very fragile moment right now where, where you can tell that the culture is going to turn in some ways. But maybe this moment that we're experiencing right now will bring forward a solution of some type. And but the problem is, is how do you contrive an authentic leftist narrative while, while not artificially injecting yourself as the underdog? Which is becoming something that increasingly does not ring true to most people's experiences with the left. Yeah, I guess uh, my I, I might have I think I mentioned this on the last stream, but you see often in uh, left wing storytelling uh, the nerd as the uh, hero, kind of the downtrodden uh, guy be, who's uh, you know uh, being uh, marginalized for not being physically strong or something like that. Uh, and you, the flip side of that in most left-wing storytelling is that the jock is a, uh, he's the one who has, is powerful and popular, but he's always kind of this brutish, uh, you know, low IQ and like obnoxious guy. But, you know, I, I find that um, in, in, re in real life, though, I find that um, usually the, the guy who plays the archetype of the jock, you know, like the uh, high school football quarterback or something like that uh more often than not uh the, who's you know has very high social status for someone of his age group very often they actually are a uh model student they're usually often a uh very um a, a very admirable young man and you oftentimes it is the uh the uh kind of nerd archetype in, in the real world who's the one who's very envious and very uh and you know very um not really the, not and not and doesn't really you know fit in this in the same way, so I I don't know in my opinion it's kind of it's kind of a reversal of um it's kind kind of a, re a reversal of hierarchy in that uh it kind of paints the the uh, high up on in the on the social hierarchy as the kind of oppressor uh the oppressor and the and the low and the person low on the hierarchy as the oppressed I guess I mean that's kind of why I I've, I've never really liked the uh. The nerd archetype or the uh, downtrodden archetype, and this is coming from someone that, like, you know, I don't think I was ever. I don't think in high school I was ever the uh, the um, the guy at the high end of the hierarchy or anything like that. I sort I was certainly far from the uh, I was certainly far from the most popular person in in, in the school. But um, I think that you know maybe and I kind of maybe I was more similar to the outsider type. I was never like a nerd, but um, I think looking back on it, I that kind of playing that archetype made makes you a lot more bitter and makes you um i, I get i guess a lot more angry at, uh, at at the traditional hierarchy and really is not really conducive to uh something that someone that actually uh, is, is not conducive towards towards a model citizen whereas the the jock type actually is and that's kind of why i've never really liked uh a lot of these uh a, a lot of these kind of nerd culture things well, I mean, you know, I, I might have the experience of uh, I, I played on a sports team for one year before I got cut because <laughs> I sucked. Uh, but but I did get because of that, you know, I, I had kind of a nerd disposition in high school, but I still have lots of more jockey friends. And uh, I, I my experience is more or less exactly like yours endeavor. And uh, one thing I realized very quickly to put it succinctly, is that I don't know about them being necessarily better students, but what they certainly had was more emotional maturity. And specifically what their experiences in sports taught them was they understood in, in a way that nerds never really did understand that they they were that there was a hierarchy of skill that was not externally imposed, like from a teacher. And that they were better than some people and worse than others. They knew what it was to compete against somebody else and lose and have that be the result of their own inabilities or mistakes. And they had to incorporate that into their personalities. So because of that reason, the jock was much more emotionally mature than his nerd counterpart, in, at least when I went to high school. And I'm sure something similar has pertained but I mean, now, I mean, in some sense, the younger millennials and, and, and in some sense, even my generation, it's defined by the dominance of people culturally who don't really understand that. They don't understand that uh, sometimes you deserve to lose and sometimes you deserve to win. And and uh, they're, they're, they're kind of people who, or at least the people who are allowed in, in the younger millennial generation, and actually the millennial generation generally, the people who are allowed have no knowledge of that. 
and uh, they they believe that all hierarchies are externally imposed. Right. Well, this is uh, one of the things about the resentment that the uh, the nerds and and left feel towards the uh, traditional hierarchy is that they have this view that the status there is unearned, and you see this in their fiction as well. If you look at superhero movies or the latest Star Wars movies, with uh, you know Ray being really powerful for no reason, um, all of their heroes are just kind of automatically placed into some position of authority and power without ever really earning it because they don't understand that the people who they resent uh, in real life actually did something to earn their status. And I, I think this is one of the reasons why, you know, playing sports and, and these sort of group uh, activities are really important for uh, younger people to engage in so that they figure this out so that they don't become these bitter adults when they get older, not understanding how the world really works. And, um, you know, so much of this too is, is, because they don't seem to actually engage with reality on any meaningful level like this to understand uh, how this, the hierarchy actually works. This is one of the reasons why too, you see so much like virtue signaling in their movies. And cause they also do this in real life. If you look at, um, if you look at some of the superhero or, or star Wars movies, the big ones that are popular, you know, often the, the heroes will kind of take this pointless stand. That's a bad idea. Uh, one, one scene I'm thinking of is if, if you recall in the last Jedi, um, you know Finn, Finn, the the black stormtrooper character is, is going to make this heroic sacrifice to blow up this this big laser beam, right? And then um, the uh, the Asian girl or whatever she she stops him, right? And it's it's just it's a completely stupid I, scene because I'm laughing just thinking about it. I'm laughing just thinking about it when you were I, I was that the um, was that the like you were not going to win by right. hating? What was the line again? I can't yeah, remember. We're, we don't win. We're going to win by loving each other, not hating our enemies or something. <laughs> so, right. So it's just a virtue signal. Right. And that that's what you see right now in Seattle is this sort of mass virtue signaling against, um, you know, the system, but these people in Chaz, they're not actually doing anything real. Most of them are just kind of walking around. So they have this view of reality that's reflected in the, in their fiction, uh, like in that scene that I described where, you know, everything just becomes a signal as opposed to real action. And I think you see that throughout superhero movies and, and the whole just nerd, the whole swath of the nerd genre. You know, I think too, if um, in the Marvel movies, there's there's often scenes in them where the, the superhero sort of refuse to make personal sacrifices. You know, they're like, we're not going to sacrifice one of us just to defeat the enemy. You see this all the time in movies, but the, the movie never really goes into the greater consequences of that where, you know, hundreds or thousands of other people will die because, you know, they're not willing to to actually make these these true sacrifices. They only want to signal their, um, you know, their goodness to one another in their little peer group. Um, I mean, I think the best example of this is uh, in the, I think it's the first Infinity War movie. If you watch it, um, there, there are several parts in the movie. Uh, one, of them, one of them in particular is... Uh, there's this character called the vision and you know, he's powered by one of the infinity stones that, that Thanos is trying to, to take. Right. And if they would simply allow the vision to sacrifice himself basically and, and destroy himself and the stone, uh, none of the horrific events that actually happen in, in the infinity war saga would actually go down. But because the heroes are not willing to make any sort of personal sacrifices that like that, uh, you know, mass suffering uh, ends up being induced on the world because they they weren't willing to sacrifice one one person for some greater principle, right? It's 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 hyper individualized, but it's also hyper individualized only towards the hero characters and not the the normal people who are affected by their actions. And and that's how the progressive sees themselves as they're this this valiant hero. And you know, what really matters is is what happens to them personally, and not you know, they're not ever thinking about the, the greater ramifications of their decisions. Yeah, you know, you know, there, there's uh, one film that I think uh, I, I thought I thought about it a lot a couple months ago when someone uh, I think uh, Devin Sack had mentioned it to me when we spoke. I can't remember where where when, uh, but it was the the film uh, the film American Pie, and uh, admittedly the the first film was actually really inner. It was actually really funny. The first one, though, all the sequels they made were absolute garbage. But you know, when I thought back on it, I just thought of how how poisonous the themes of American Pie really were, and really how uh, really the um, 
the the warped vision of reality that it really put into people's heads. Because so you know, it's a film about a bunch of uh, guys who are you know high school outcasts uh, tr that are b basically desperate to um, to get laid before their high school uh, graduation or something like that. Uh, and you know, I think that it's kind of one of these, you know, nerds rise up films. Uh, but I, I find that um, it, it was just such a poisonous film back in the day because it it really, I think, destroyed a lot of young men's self esteem. Like it made a lot of, I think, young guys feel like they were either losers or if they if they you know uh, weren't successful weren't successful with women when they were like you know sixteen or seventeen when you know you're a, an awkward teenager. And, you know, it really, um, uh, and it also played into the whole, like, you know, the, the dumb, uh, the dumb, uh, obnoxious jock being like this kind of, uh, oppressor who's on the top of the peer, uh, on top of the social hierarchy with, um, the, the, uh, I wouldn't really say he's the antagonist, but, uh, the character, uh, Stifler, who everyone remembers as being the funniest guy, uh, you know, he, he played the, he was, I think a football player or something like that. And uh, he was essentially the Chad of the school. He, uh, he was, he was, he was the most successful one. They all looked up to him. He was the most successful with women. And uh, I, I find that like um, it, it, as a film, I, I think that uh, it, it really kind of put a lot of bad ideas in, in, in young men's minds back in the day, even though, even though it was, it was a funny film, admittedly, but I think that it really kind of uh, instilled in a lot of young guys kind of the uh, that kind of uh, bitter outsider nerd uh, mentality. And I, it's just one that I think is really an un unhealthy message for someone who's, you know, 15, 16, 17 to, to hear when, you know, you're you're not you're not mature yet. You're not really like a uh, you haven't really come into your own. And, you know, it gives you this idea that, well, the reason that you're you know, you're not. Uh, you're not as successful uh, socially by then is because there's something wrong with you and not because, uh, you know, you, you just haven't, uh, you just haven't come into, you just haven't matured as an adult yet. Yeah. It, um, I mean, it, it's pretty simple that this whole narrative of the, of like the nerd outcast, um, I, it, it, it's the, it's just the classic, uh, I guess, you know, boomer concept called cultural Marxism. Um, that they, they want to turn the nerds and that they wanted, they don't really anymore. They wanted to turn the nerds into the proletariats and the jocks into the bourgeoisie. Um, uh, and it, it, uh, it just, you know, radicalized the nerds to make them left wing. Um, but for whatever reason in the long term, that didn't end up working out. Here's something interesting. I just thought of too, um, in terms of honor and status, right. And the, the nerd is always is trying to elevate himself to to some unearned position of power, which is what we see rampant in society today with the inversions of hierarchies. Consider the riots that are happening now, right? All of these soy boy socialist types who are infiltrating Chaz and these other movements, you know, they don't do the hard work of, of burning everything down, right? They leave that to other people. In this case, you know, the, the black community, right? They allow them to go through all of the the actual difficult acts that they would like to carry out themselves and they come in and capitalize upon it after the fact. So even, even within their own uh, radical movement, they're not actually willing to put in the, the work themselves to earn the status. They just attach themselves to it after the fact, like a parasite and then leech off of it. I mean, it's really amazing to see Chaz play out because <laughs> it just, it's this really, really weird experiment in, I don't want to say social Darwinism, but just it just shows you that when when you turn a social hierarchy upside down, you essentially get people hopping on the bandwagon to be as unproductive and as sanctimonious as possible. There, there's a hierarchy there, but it's a hierarchy that is totally disastrously poisonous, and and, and it, it's actually kind of amazing to see it play out. and And it's something that I've been kind of I mean, I just sort of been sort of fascinated by uh, Chaz, not only because it happens to be on like, you know, I, I used to live in Seattle and, and, uh, and uh, you know, I got married there and uh, we had uh, my, my sort of, not, it was not, not really a bachelor party in the classic sense, but the party with all the guys before the wedding uh, was there. And uh, I'm always thinking like, oh man, I remember that place like just from a few, from like a year ago or two, I guess it was two years ago. It's been a while. Um, and now, now it's just like this complete dump. <laughs> 
<laughs> and not only that, it's like it's it's like the weirdest, stupidest people have suddenly gotten license to just lord over everyone else and be the masters of society. And now it's their chance to just like take revenge. <laughs> I, I don't know what to say about this. Like I was kind of, I, I kind of was, I kind of theoretically understood that this was possible, but I guess I'm seeing confirmation that this actually does happen this way. I don't, I'm, I, it's hard not to be kind of sanctimonious about it, but uh, I mean, I don't know what to say. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, it, it it's, it, it's so perfect. It seems like something that I'd expect out of some right wing skit. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um. It, almost, it, 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 makes, it makes it feel like I'm watching one of those, like those boomer con, like cringe, you know, oh, this is why we don't like socialism, bucko, you know, but but, it, it, but it's real. <laughs> yeah, it sort of reminds me of um, Michelle Huelbeck's um, novel Submission. I don't know if you've ever read that, but it, it's actually, it, it seems just as absurd. But then when things like this happen, you realize how society can just completely invert itself on a whim just by being handed over to, to these idiots. What's interesting too is their their hierarchy is fundamentally unstable, right? Because, okay, yeah, it's this anarchist zone, but at any point, you know, uh, Arch Pimp Lord Raz or whatever his name is can just come in with his guys and his guns and just, uh, you know, do whatever he wants basically. Because the, the 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 leftists aren't actually in control of the situation. You know, they're they're just sort of allowed to to play yeah. about and, and play with their silly gardens while the real power uh, is still existing there in this this tribal form. Yeah, I actually haven't been following it that closely. Uh, I mean, I guess it, my real takeaway from it is just how outrageous, outrageous it is that that's even being tolerated right now. That that's that's my big takeaway from that. But I, I guess that's kind of a, a topic for a different stream. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, what, I guess it just it just shows how dysfunctional uh, a lack of hierarchy it is. It really just shows how dysfunctional anarchy is you know uh all the anarcho-communists on on twitter with the you know bernie sanders uh avatars within the red and black backgrounds well uh btfo'd i guess uh so yeah but kind of not though right like that's that's the thing like you know as much as you as much as everyone much as this is just like the perfect possible play out of these ideas it, it, you know for a fact that, that nobody, nobody from BreadTube is going to see this and go like, oh, guys, I guess this doesn't work. I guess there's some serious <laughs> oh, flaws about this, you know, this democratic socialism thing, like even on a small scale. I mean, you know, it's... Well, Ch Chaz is left-wing fiction, right? Like it is the ultimate left-wing fiction because it's not real. It's been, it's being supported from the outside. You know, the police in the city of Seattle are, are, are bringing in porta-potties and cleaning up and... And this sort of stuff and and ultimately it's just this sort of contained environment that's being allowed to happen but but nothing about Chaz is real nothing about it is actually demonstrating that anything the progressive left left wants is sustainable it's it's well, a fiction yeah. in of itself and I, I mean i guess that's even that's, that's sort of a double down irony i i guess i mean the question is is just you know what what now, I'm kind of getting frustrated with this. I think it's I'm just getting frustrated with reality. The, what, what the left, however, the left has shown this week is that the left has shown in the last month that it's basically the uncontested master of the West, as far as I'm concerned. The display of power they've been able to put forth has shown that, uh, you know, basically, I mean, basically, it's the cathedral flexing on us, right? Uh, I mean, you know, and and and, and it's terrifying. Uh, they can they can basically rewrite reality, and you know well, that is what it is, I guess, right? I don't want to be too, uh, you know, uh, self pitying, uh, but but the question is, you know, now now what kind of right wingers have to deal with is they have to deal with, okay, so we're like, we're, we're not in power, right? We're not we're not in power, you know, in any sense that that's meaningful that that can apply even the law to people who burn cities, uh, but. So what does that mean, right? Like, and also the left's not learning from its mistakes and they're reveling in their own ignorance about, they're kind of proud about the fact that they're not learning from their mistakes, which is even kind of scarier. And I guess everyone on the right is wondering like, okay, so what, what does this mean? <laughs> what is this, what's the takeaway from this whole adventure we've been on for the last month? And I don't know if anyone really has a good answer to that yet. Yeah, I, I mean, at the end of the day, because I, I know for the next 10 years, 
uh, uh, anyone on the right from boomer cons to us are probably going to be talking about Chaz and and telling leftists like th this is obviously the um, the end result of your, your ideas um, and, and that no leftist will care. Um, yeah, and and they'll, they'll have a meme with like a wall of text that will that will begin like scoffing like, oh my god, Chaz again. I thought we've been through this a thousand times. Chaz is the proper <laughs> experiment. You now like, you know, a wall, wall of text next to a doge dog or something like that. Yeah, you can already imagine it, right? Yeah, it, it, it's obviously going to happen. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's the cathedral. It's the, the, the left has all the opinion making institutions on their side. Um, so it, it doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't yeah. like the, the facts don't matter. The the events that are happening don't matter. Um, uh, all that matters is they're going to be able to pump out their message from the authoritative sources. Yeah, I mean, there's there's not going to be any. You know, and I think and I, I really want to get us back on the topic of left wing fiction. But I think that this has sort of been a wake up call for a lot of people. Uh, you know, it is it's people like Stephen Pinker. It's it's the, that crowd of people. Who I think, you know, in the early 2000s, believe it or not, Steven Pinker was supposedly kind of a based voice in all of this, right? But but ne but now he's not going to learn anything from any of this, right? Uh, obviously, so or people like him aren't, right? Uh, they're they're manifestly not going to learn anything from this. That's not what they do. What they're what they they exist to do is they exist to occupy some place that looks marginally more rational than the people actually tearing down the cities. Uh, but but not to any different end, and because of the and and because of learning a deeper lesson that would prevent this from happening in the future, would would threaten that that strategic misremembering of history. So uh, I guess to to get back more to the topic, one of the interesting things about um, the left and fiction is that fiction is so controlled by the left uh, to such an extreme degree that. We basically have an infinite supply of things to talk about. One of the interesting things I've noticed is that um, if you think of a game series like Mass Effect, for example, the, the left-wing decisions are just sort of automatically programmed in as the good guy decisions, and any right-wing decisions are, you know, the bad guy option, even though the game doesn't exactly frame them that way, but that's kind of what it is. You know, anything that has to do with, with using force against evil, with with any sort of identity that isn't purely progressive and inclusive. These are always like the bad options. I, I think of it kind of like um, the way uh, like Gryffindor and Slytherin are portrayed in Harry Potter as well. Like, oh my God, that's a great place to start. I haven't seen Mass Effect, but Harry Potter is the perfect example where it's like, they, they have like a right wing house and it might as well be called Evil House. Yeah, you know? it's, it's Evil House. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's, like, it's like a college for evil people. It's. It, it, I mean, it, I think you What's know. What's a college for evil ten-year-olds? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, it, it's basically like it's basically like the snooty frouse. It's like it's like it's basically like the, the the snotty snobby frat house from Animal House. If anyone remembers that old movie, uh, but but it's even worse because uh, I mean because I think in anyone in Animal House there's at least some self awareness that like you know portraying these like conservative guys as being evil is kind of like not real and like oh hey we're kind of, we're aware that what we're doing is sort of like interpretive fiction but with 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 uh, Harry Potter it's just it's it, it, it's evil house for 10 year olds and uh you know i mean like you, you have to wonder why they even allow this house right. to be there right <laughs> that's what i'm thinking cuz they 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 grow up to join the the evil yeah the evil racist guys like you know it's they don't even really stop being Slytherin. It's like it's, it, it's kind of the same thing. It, for some reason, they're just running this this fifth column in yeah, their like be, elementary like, school. It would, like going, it would be like going to yeshiva and then going like, oh, so do you want to be part of like the Nazi house? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, I, I mean, it, it, it's basically Hillary Clinton's basket of deplorables. Twenty five percent of the school is just awful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, well, I, think, I think this goes into what how the left really can't can't really create evil. They can't really write evil into fiction because their evil is always either somebody who is only bad because they were oppressed. So they're only like the victim because they were like abused as that kid or something like that, or uh, or they're just like uh, irredeemably evil and have no like motivation whatsoever. Like they can't actually uh, under like for example they can't understand the concept of something like sin they can't understand that uh, there's there's good that people can do uh, any 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 given person can do good or can do evil and that re really um, 
there's a there's a, a quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn that I really like. That what he said was, uh, I'm currently reading the Gulag Archipelago. What Solzhenitsyn said was that evil doesn't div divide good people from bad, but it runs down the center of every human heart. And what he means by that is that every every human being is capable of committing uh, fantastic goods or horrible evils. But you see, in, in these left wing fictions, like like you mentioned, Slytherin. They're, they're just they're just bad for the sake of being bad. They're just assholes because uh, they're um, they need they need bad guys. Like they, they just have someone who's just an absolute um, who's just absolutely evil for the sake of being evil. The, and, you know, it's always meant to be you know the the Hitler archetype, the right winger, or something like that. Someone like Voldemort, or um, I don't know, I don't know who else. Uh, I'm just I'm trying to think of, of some some left wing villains off the top of my head, like Kylo Ren or something like that. I mean, maybe he's he's bad because he was oppressed or something. Uh, but then all like all their villains are just so one dimensional. It's either well, it's society's fault, or they're just this evil, horrible right winger who wants to eat children and you know kill puppy dogs for fun. And they just can't really create good, uh, convincing villains. Mm -hmm. I was thinking uh, just of other fiction I've seen. And one of the things I realized just now was um, I think one of the reasons like uh, villains in anime tend to be so good is because they always have a motive, at least in the good ones, right? I mean, there's, there's plenty of trash up there, but usually, um, you know, the, the motive of a good villain might be like, you know, he's extremely ruthless and, and maybe he, he murders people, but at the end of the day, he's trying to do something like better society through these ruthless uh, means by you know stopping crime with an iron fist or something like that whereas yeah, like death note yeah uh, i was yeah i was actually thinking death note um psychopaths is another example where the villain does have you could say le some legitimate real motivation motivation for what he's doing but you know in western media you just don't see that at all even even when they try a little bit like um in the marvel movies like thanos sort of has this idea where he's going to you know uh, you know, erase half of the uh, living beings in the universe for some reason because there's too many resources being used up. But it, it's such a flimsy motivation; they they kind of barely even build on it. And I, I think that Thanos is probably the only villain I could even think of that has any sort of motivation whatsoever. You know, if you think of someone like Voldemort and the Death Eaters who follow him, why are they even why are they even working with him? Like, what does Voldemort offer them? It's and not even, clear. Even, in, even in Thanos' case, they fix that, right? They're like, oh, oh, this is getting too nuanced. And like the second movie, they they bring him back and he's just like pure evil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They they sort of, uh, yeah, they just uh, erase any of his nuance whatsoever in the second movie. But yeah, it's yeah. like uh, the Death Eaters, like why do they follow Voldemort? I don't think, uh, it's been a long time since I've read Harry Potter, but I don't, I don't think they ever actually laid out any of the motivations. You see, Charlemagne, the problem is here is that if you were a clever retconner, right, uh, if you were somebody who was, uh, you know, a really good Harry Potter fan fiction writer, or maybe even if you're J.K. Rowling herself, who's feeling like she if she gained political nuance, it would be very, very easy to write in a quasi-sympathetic explanation for for the Death Eaters. Um, I could I could think of one, and you could you could recast Harry Potter in a totally different light. But you get the sense that if that was inserted anywhere in the text, the fans would rebel against it more than they rebelled against J.K. Rowling for thinking the biological sex is real. Hmm. Yeah, I think though it is kind of uh, ironic that Harry Potter, uh, while it is like you know just progressive. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, it's not it's not as blatant as the current propaganda, but it is it is pr a progressive uh, entertainment. And there's no doubt, but it is interesting that uh, kind of the world that they that they created, especially in like the films, is that um, you it, it resembles a traditional European uh, society. So places like Hogwarts, it's like this neo gothic, um, uh, almost like monastery of some kind. Uh, I mean, it looks like a it looks like an English school from you know the early twentieth or late nineteenth century, and um, and you know it, it is interesting that kind of like uh, even though the progressive messaging is is uh, obviously uh, the overarching theme, it does seem to exist in a, in a uh, hierarchical and uh, in somewhat traditional uh, looking uh, society, and and you know that the, that that theme is something that. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, of Harry Potter's fans, even a lot of the progressive ones. Uh, in fact, I think pretty much every Harry Potter fan is progressive. But um, 
all of them still really kind of love the traditional European aesthetic and uh, and and uh, of the Harry Potter universe. So it, it is interesting that even with those themes, they kind of ha have certain, uh, I guess you could say, right wing or traditionalist uh, themes in Harry Potter. I haven't read the book in a while, but it is, but you do definitely see that in the aesthetics. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's always the thing with uh, these thing these. Um, properties that they inherit is that the left wing loves using characters and settings that are thoroughly right wing game of thrones yeah exactly game of thrones is a perfect example even in I, star trek which is sort of a, a a progressive environment they can't help but always having the captains be reactionaries or a type of person that could only come about in a reactionary setting cisco Definitely Kirk and Picard are all examples of of sort of these aristocratic personalities, I'll, I'll say it, and they couldn't exist anywhere else. And so the whole thing is, is you're playing kind of this weird game where you're sitting in an environment that had to have been built by principles that are larger than the ones that the plot itself recommends yeah like for for example the uh this i just think of like the setting of harry potter of like one of these libraries with these like um uh, w with these wooden uh with wooden paneling these tall bookshelves and these old like uh wizard scrolls and things like that uh what it, does that presuppose right it presupposes that there's a past that's worth remembering that there are ancient peoples who wrote things down for us that can guide us now. Like there's so many things that are communicated inside just the existence of a library with old books that, I mean, th the left cannot explain why large Gothic libraries with old books even should exist for a properly, for a society with proper ethics. Like why? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and you know, it's something that it, that's kind of one of the, uh, and that, that's one thing I always thought of as, you know, in, in Harry Potter. I always thought that that was kind of the coolest thing about it. The coolest thing was the setting. The coolest thing was yeah. like these like big corridors and these uh, libraries and these dungeons and things like that. I always but thought the setting that. Has a, the setting has a message to it, right? Like, why does any of, why do, why do large old schools exist? Why do libraries exist? Why does Captain Picard, why does his favorite book book Moby Dick? Like, uh, why is his favorite book written by an old white man who was born when slavery was still around and wrote the book shortly afterwards about about basically about people who commit environmental crimes against whales? <laughs> like, it doesn't make any sense. Nothing makes sense, right? Uh, you can't imagine the the story kind of has this seam that you can drag out and and unravel the entire thing, right? So, um. I feel like Harry Potter is kind of easy pickings, despite, you know, it's, it's worth talking about just because of how influential it is on the progressive mind. But I think um, something like Game of Thrones is a bit more subtle and interesting. So like, to me, some of the progressive guys that uh, ideas in there are like, you know, basically the only good character in the whole series to some extent is someone like Ned Stark, right? And and what happens to, to him, he gets basically immediately destroyed by all of these like evil patriarchal houses around them, which is kind of how the left uh, views itself, right? It, it views itself as this imminently vulnerable position just waiting to be swallowed up by all these evil right-wingers. Um, yeah, but Ned, Ned Stark is, I mean, the, the, the funny thing about Game of Thrones is that there is a progressive character in Game of Thrones and it's not Ned Stark. Ned Stark and indeed all of the Starks are, if you were to take the world seriously, they would be reactionaries. They are yes. literally stand-ins for the Jacobites, right? They are literally stand-ins for the Jacobites. They are Northern loyalists who, who believe that they have some claim of succession against the system that's fundamentally honest, and they discover that it's not. That was the complaint of people who were supporting the Stuarts as well. And or or at least the Catholic Stuart kings, right? And, um, and but the but the but what's so strange about Game of Thrones is that uh, I think they could have made it. There's no satisfying way of ending it without telling a reactionary story. Uh, the, the the progressive character in Game of Thrones is Daenerys Targaryen, obviously. 
Yeah, I mean, in the books and the show for sure. Yeah, um, I, I don't think I don't think the Starks are are progressive, but they're in the in the first book at least. They're sort of the 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 good guys who aren't you know these, and they're they're put up against these other houses or, who are who are kind of like Slytherin. Like the Lannisters are treated kind of like Slytherin, even though it's not really clear to me that they're that any house in Game of Thrones is really these ultra evil bad guys as the writer likes to betray them as. Um, yeah, you know, I think I think I mean. At least in the first three books, Martin was a much more subtle writer than Rowling was. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that, you know, I I do agree that the Lannisters are portrayed as being horribly corrupt. But I think that, you know, I think Martin knows better than to give them the Slytherin treatment outright. Well, I mean, the the concept, uh, the, the, the concept of a ruling dynasty that's horribly corrupt is realistic. The, the concept of 10 year olds that are evil to the bone is a bit more disturbing. Yeah, true, true. Although, well, the, uh, then, then I should say that, that 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 that's the next thing that Game of Thrones does is they have a ten-year-old Lannister who's evil to the bone, right? Uh, I, I actually haven't seen the series. I've just heard okay. people talk about it. Well, the Lannister children are corrupt, right? Like, uh, Cersei. One of them is. Yeah, yeah but, but Tywin. I'm really thinking of Tywin, right? Like Tywin is sort of the 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 classic patriarch, and when I it's it's been a long time since I've really read the books, but. Uh, you know, thinking about Tywin, it's it's hard for me to come up with, uh, you know, what he did wrong. Um, insofar as attempting to run his house in this dangerous world, uh, where all of these other dangerous powers are vying for power. Um, even though yeah. the 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 narrative wants to betray him as sort of the evil version of of Ned Stark, it's not really clear to me that if you if you sort of told the story from his perspective as opposed to from the Stark perspective, that things would really look any different. Um. Well, I, you know, maybe I don't want to, I have a low opinion of George R. R. Martin. Yeah. But I, I do feel that that subtlety was intentional. Hmm. Uh, I, I don't think that, you know, again, I don't think that, I think that that probably is what the author intended. Uh, you know, even though, but I guess the question is, is that if you encountered a Tywin Lannister figure in, 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 in the real world, like some kind of Caesar, um, Caesar-like figure, uh, the the left would a, a, a progressive like Martin would absolutely oppose any kind of analysis of our current situations from that perspective. I, I would assume. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I actually haven't uh, watched or read Game of Thrones, so I can't really, I can't really <laughs> comment on it. There was actually one idea I did have recently, and uh, I was get, trying to, I was trying to think of a video I can do about this, but I haven't really been able to uh, fully like conceptualize it in my mind yet. But um, one thing I noticed about Star Trek, which um, is a, a progressive um, series film um, series of TV shows. There's mul- multiple ones. And it's kind of a, uh, it, it, what you see in Star Trek is that, cause it was mentioned a bit earlier that it's kind of like the, uh, the European union or something like that, trying to turn the entire galaxy liberal or something like that, or the UN. Uh, but what I find, one reason I really don't like Star Trek is that it doesn't feel epic. It doesn't feel like uh, the the world that they've created, like the Federation. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't feel like spiritually strong. It just feels like really nihilistic and empty, just like how, you know, liberalism spreading itself across the globe really is uh, in, in the real world. And what, what, one thing I was wondering about is that how, um, uh, how right wing or, or illiberal uh, f- uh, fictitious orders seem so much more uh, epic. They seem so much more uh, grandiose, like the, like the Imperium from Warhammer 40K, which we discussed last time. Uh, it, it's just like the, that it, it feels like it's so, uh, so much more. They just feel like the universe of 40K is so much more interesting than the Star Trek universe because uh, you know, there. I just think that fundamentally, uh, the kind of liberal values of uh, of Star Trek and the liberal values of the Federation are nihilistic and really empty. And them kind of like spreading themselves across the galaxy, it really just it it really just feels like you know, uh, it, it really it really just feels spiritually dead. Whereas something like forty in forty k, you actually feel like um, you 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 it, it makes it. it in, how do I how do I explain this correctly? Uh, 
in something like 40k you actually feel like there is some kind of spirituality behind uh something like the imperium whereas i find like these like uh, fictitious uh orders which are liberal it they just don't appeal to me because i just don't really find them interesting i don't find their uh their um uh, th their quest to you know liberalize the galaxy it just uh it's it really just doesn't uh it's just really just not appealing in a store for storytelling really there's um there's an interesting sci-fi um, alternative to Star Trek called uh, The Expanse, which is actually based on a book series, I think. Um, the Expanse is interesting because it it um, it's about uh, Earth in like you know 500 years from now or something, and you basically got a neoliberal world order on Earth itself. The Martians are sort of their own militaristic, um, different race of humans at this point in terms of their you know, adaptation to gravity and whatnot. And you also have what's called belters. And the belters are sort of like these social outcasts who live in the asteroid belt and they can't walk on planets anymore. And, you know, the storyline sets it up such that they're basically abused by by Earth and, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of like quasi-proletariat in the sense that, you know, they're not paid. They do these, they're not paid well. They do these dangerous jobs and Earth is exploiting them for resources, and it, it kind of feels like you're really supposed to take the Belter's side in the show, um, even when they're doing, you know, blatantly terroristic acts. Um, the show sort of always paints them as the underdog, and like you really should be rooting for these these poor, abused souls who live in these squalid conditions. You know, even though they they're also running gangs and just you know, uh, they're really dangerous. They're they're doing piracy, but it's all okay because they're oppressed, right? Um, but it's interesting because when I watched the, sh the show, um, I kind of viewed the Martians as the good guys, even though they're they're sort of the cartoon bad guy of the series where all they do is basically they have this big, uh, powerful military and they're very militaristic. Uh, and, you know, the Martians are kind of the meanies. And uh, even though Earth isn't exactly cast in a good light, you know, there's a lot of corrupt bureaucrats. Um, I think Earth's way in the series, the sort of neoliberal star trek proto star trek way of of governing the solar system is kind of viewed as the the ideal order um it's a pretty interesting show because um i feel like you know again sort of like game of thrones if you if you if you brought the show more to the perspective of of say the martians you know you could easily view them as as the good guys in the show as, as opposed to the the social outcasts that it wants you to take the side of this is always the problem, though, and I haven't seen the show you're talking about, but there there always is a danger in gravitating towards a media and identifying with the villains. I mean, you know, it, it, this happens probably a lot for people on the right because of the fact that in this new progressive era, there's only one villain that progressives can think of, and that's a reactionary. Uh, but I think there's some danger in doing that because there's this tendency mixed in with the genuinely sympathetic and reactionary elements of these bad characters will be genuine moral malfeasance and weakness. Uh, and so it kind of creates a narrative that will be fundamentally confusing for somebody who's looking to live as a good person and also as somebody who has right wing values. Well, this is one of the reasons the expanse is interesting because the Martians aren't explicitly the villains. Um, mm -hmm. They're just sort of, if you rank the three factions on the progressive stack, they basically come out at the bottom because they're, you know, very martial and more traditional and militaristic. But it's it's only in their self defense, and there there are plenty of good Martian characters as well. You know, one of the the main cast is a Martian, a woman, of course. It has to be a woman, but it, that's one of the reasons I think the Expanse is interesting because it actually it want you can feel that it wants to have the Martians be a cartoon bad guy, but. I suppose its hands are kind of tied in the sense that it's actually based on a book series, uh, I think. And um, it can't actually do that. Mm. And it, it sort of, um, it sort of exposes, I think the, the folly of these other fictional works that, that do take that step because, you know, it, it sort of gets you thinking in that frame of mind where, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to imagine that in any of these, you know, sci-fi drama series that the, the bad guys are just, purely evil they're probably more like the martians in this show mm -hmm. um another interesting one is uh altered carbon yeah has anyone seen altered carbon no 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 that's like um that's an interesting show so it's also based on a book and um it's sort of blade runner-esque i guess um 
it's based once again, like in the the near future, and and it's it's everything's very dirty and grimy. It's sort of um, the ultimate realization of where Earth is headed in the progressive frame of mind, I suppose, where it's just going to become this uh, disaster zone. And it's really interesting because you see all of this. Um, you know, there's just absolute sexual liberation. Everyone can just do whatever they want. Humans are quasi immortal, but at the same time, everything is just kind of like you wouldn't want to live in this world, even though uh, you know the technology is is much more advanced uh, than we have now, which is pretty interesting because you know usually these these sci fi's tend to be somewhat utopic. I find like like Star Trek, but in in um, Altered Carbon, it's it's kind of the opposite. It's like despite all of the the liberation from religion and social norms, uh, things haven't gotten better at all. Oh, well, this is this follows sort of the standard uh, cyberpunk formula from uh, Neuromancer and all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can see that you know what what sort of the narrative that's forming in my mind is that what we have is we have a series of uh, media products that are created after two thousand and twelve. And the ones that really stand out as having something to offer are all constrained by basically books that were written before the turning point in the culture. And the ones that aren't just kind of go off the rails in these weird progressive, not even weird progressive, predictable progressive directions, I should say. Um, whereas, uh, whereas the ones that uh, kind of adhere to the source material are actually able to maintain their focus on interesting human trade-offs and interesting questions. Yeah. Um, one thing that, uh, one thing I've been looking at a lot recently is kind of uh, how the modern, the, how the morality of the modern liberal was formed. And I, I've been looking back at a lot of, uh, a lot of film and culture and uh, literature from the last, you know, 50, 60 years. And there does seem to be this kind of, uh, this, this kind of pattern that you see in, I mean, I think that this was this started off with *To Kill a Mockingbird*, which is a a book and film that I really dislike. I think it's really it's really lousy in my opinion. But uh, what you notice is that there's always this. Um, they always portray the. Um, they'll always have this one character, this one white male character, who basically just uh, is an irredeemable racist. He screams every single word that he says. And he'll just treat non-white people like absolute garbage just for the sake of it. And then there'll always be this kind of, and now the left has kind of turned against this archetype because it was, this was brought in when, you know, uh, before, you know, the demographics got to the level they are now, but the archetype was what they called the white savior complex. Like this is someone like Atticus Finch uh, from To Kill a Mockingbird. It, like the, the, the good guy, the good guy is the liberal guy who takes the side of, um, takes the side of, of the out group on be, um, against, against his own in group. So um, you, you can see that this kind of trope in, in uh, some films like, uh, like Django Unchained is a, is a, uh, is a really uh, re a re more recent example. And I mean, I think we discussed that one on the, on the last stream and about how, how I just, I really dislike that film, but what you, you, you really see is um, the, the, uh, I guess my, my, my reaction, my interactions with modern liberals has been like them trying to act out that, um, that, mo that, uh, what the left now calls the white savior complex it is them trying to act out the character who, you know, um, basically takes the side of his, of an out group against his own in group. And that makes, that's what makes him a virtuous, uh, that that's what makes him a virtuous, uh, individual. And, mm -hmm. um, but what you think the problem is that when it's actually put into reality, um, the truth, the fact of the matter usually is that um, just when you're just going on on state on averages, uh, usually the behavior of um, the certain the, the certain out groups with the, which the left uh, wants to protect is usually not always as savory as it is in the films, and the uh, so-called egregious behavior of the um, of the so-called uh, white racists is usually not to that is usually not as um, uh, it's usually not as um, extreme and and um, uh, evil as it's portrayed as in these movies. And that's kind of how you get things like 
Covington Catholic, I thought. I thought like, you know, that when you see something like the Covington Catholic uh, case, it's the um, it's the white liberal trying to enact the uh, enact the that kind of um, uh, left wing trope from films. It's the it's them taking the side of of the out group against their against their own in group. But it, when you when that's actually brought into reality, because, you know, in real life, there's very little um, evil, horrible uh, white male, who, white men who just scream everything they say and treat non-whites like garbage just for the sake of it. And very little. Um, uh, and there's very few, you know, uh, people of color who are just like uh, perfect individuals who are just oppressed by these horrible white men just for the just for the fact that they're different. The, like the, the liberals see something like Covington Catholic and they see like the guy drumming in the face of the boy and the boy just standing there, they're smiling. They see that, that kind of trope acted out and their kind of instinct of what the, their, their instinct uh, that's been influenced by things like to kill a mockingbird is to take the side of the out group and to lash out at the, uh, at the boys. And it, I kind of felt like um, that was an example of uh, them at them enacting the last 50 years of uh, progressive entertainment as, as it comes to race in uh, in real life. But when it's actually put into real life, it's actually not very virtuous. It's actually just vicious and uh, cruel in many ways. I, I would wonder. I mean, I, I, I definitely feel what you're saying, Endeavor. I'd be curious to see how much that archetype influenced the current crop of uh, – progressive white people because it does seem like they're reenacting that trope again and again and again the problem is is that i can't really remember that trope being as frequent as i i, I can remember obviously django and in to kill a mockingbird and perhaps a handful of other movies lots of john grisham movies have that character for instance uh but but i can't i can't quite put my finger on it as being such a consistent character in in my own memory of fiction, but, I guess. Like you, you know, you know what? Um, you know, uh, and I was <laughs> one film that I I saw that I actually w was really. Uh, it was probably the the film that the only film that I've ever loved and hated at the same time. It was the film The Sand Pebbles, and um, it w w and for anyone who doesn't know, it's about an American gunboat in the in China during the Civil War in the nineteen twenties, and it has and it's uh, it was came out in nineteen sixty six, and Steve McQueen is the lead actor. Now that is a freaking good setup for a film. Now that that is like that's like right up my alley. Like I thought, oh, like this this film is going to be absolutely fantastic, and half the film was absolutely as good as it sounds. It's a fantastic action film, a uh, fantastic setting. Steve McQueen is a great actor. It's directed by Robert Wise. He was a great director. But there's a subplot where you know these other soldiers just treat these. Um, they'll treat the, the Chinese just like absolute garbage for no reason other than just the fact that they want to get this, the cram this anti-racism message in there. Like there's a scene where uh, this, where, where um, they were like betting over this, uh, they're, they're trying to like, uh, the, the American soldiers are trying to like buy sex with this Chinese woman. And there's one guy on the ship who like, you know, tries to start a fight with one of these Chinese workers for no reason. And then Steve McQueen and one of the other sailors take the side of, of the, uh, of the you know um, Chinese workers who are supposedly being oppressed by these horrible evil white men, and like it's a it's a subplot which completely uh, takes you out of the movie because you know the the plot of the movie should be like these American guys that are in a completely foreign land that is hostile to them, but then you have uh, the 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 protagonist taking the side of the out group against his own in group, and it completely takes you out of the movie. So um, <laughs> I actually I actually posted this on. Uh, my discord a while ago, I actually suggested to people uh, and I didn't say what, what the movie was, but this was the movie I said, uh, would, you, would you be interested in seeing a fan edit of a movie where I just, <laughs> I, I just edit out all the, um, I just edit out all the, the um, anti-white themes in this film and, and pre pre present a uh, coherent uh, narrative because I think you could actually do that with this film because it was one of these films that, like I just love the setting. I love the action in the films. I love uh, Steve McQueen as an actor. I love the plot, except for this one like subplot, which is just completely crammed in there and completely wrecks the. It, it completely wrecks the entire the entire the theme of the story. But I I, that, I mean that's where I thought of this kind of archetype that it's always it's like this white character who um, sides with uh, with the out group against this one white character, another white character who just 
is this irredeemable racist who just treats everyone as like crap just for the sake of it. That's where that's where I thought of that theme. One of the things I want to know is uh, where does left wing media go from here in the the post Chaz post you know whatever is going on right now where white people are just prostrating themselves on the ground like doesn't uh, fiction have to follow this for them to be satisfied with it anymore? I mean, oh, it does, and that's what's going to be so fascinating. Like where like, where I, can I'm it just, go? I'm waiting my. The only way it can go, they have to just come up with like, right, I mean, they have to go with the right wingers or secretly causing all of this, right? They have to go with like the Tom Clancy novel where right wingers have uh, invented an evil destructural beam that causes <laughs> these racial conflicts to emerge in seemingly progressive communities. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it has to go in that direction. Is there any other way it can go? I, I don't see it. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree that it has to go in that direction. I just, I. I can't conceive of, of how you would even make a coherent movie out of that. I, I mean, I, I guess that's just... I, I, I mean, I, I, I think it, I, I could think of some ways. I mean, for, like, Chaz the movie, the, the reason why the Chaz commune doesn't work out is because all the big businesses get together and are terrified of it, so they say they're not going to sell them anything, so then yeah. they allow babies to starve to death. Well, yeah, I, I get that. I mean, I, could, I, can, I can understand theoretically how you would make it a movie. I just mean it would be so detached from reality that most people or, you know, the half of the country that isn't insane wouldn't even be able to watch it. I mean, that's where I see sort of fiction going, I guess, where like uh, some of it is going to have to get so ridiculous that uh, normal people, what are they going to think of it? How are they even going to watch it? It seems like, well, uh, yeah, I, I, like I don't know, tw twenty years from now, everyone will have seen Chaz the movie, and no one will have seen the real thing. Hmm. After Boomer Cons, forget about it. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just uh, super pessimistic, but that just seems how it always goes. Like, like, how, like, like I, how, how many people get their history of um, of the Red Scare from actual books, and how many people get it from uh, from vague statements on from television shows about how awful the Red Scare was. Yeah, I first I first learned about the Red Scare by watching the Manchurian Candidate. Hmm. Which, yeah, I guess you're right. In, in, in hindsight, it's uh, in hindsight it, it, when I saw it, I'm like, oh my god, this is a movie about evil communists trying to take over the United States. But if you if you if you're if you're subtle about how they do it, this is a Kennedy. I think it was Kennedy's favorite film. Uh, they they blamed the communist takeover on McCarthy himself. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so be, because, because because he wanted to stop something from happening, and because he was, uh, he was secretly yeah. in league with them, he was he was a secret communist spy. <laughs> oh well, I don't know. It's, it's just like one of the progressive tropes you also see is that well, because you're trying to stop a problem, that's actually making the problem worse. You know, yeah, that's another one. They could have gone that way too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one that I really despise. Like you know, because you're trying to stop uh, dr people from getting addicted to drugs, you're actually making people you're actually making more people addicted to drugs you know because you because you don't want communists to be teaching uh their ideology open to the next generation of educated professionals you're actually going to make more of them communists uh, that's one thing i absolutely hate from the left mm -hmm. and it's completely disingenuous because they know damn well that if you if you don't want if there's an ideology if there's an idea you don't want you crush it uh outright and you prevent it from having any influence whatsoever but then they kind of sneak in their own by saying well you know if you actually suppress something then it just makes it more prevalent or may maybe that's kind of like a maybe that's kind of like a uh, a um a, something that they've got they've inserted into the right wing to deliberately make the right wing uh afraid of using power i think i think you know so you know you'll get the conservative saying well i'm not I don't believe in this, but I don't, I'm not going to actually do something to stop it because then that would make it happen even more. And I, I, how many times have I run into that argument? I mean, that, that seems to be like the entire uh, libertarian on academic agent uh, it, on academic agents discourse, or that's like their entire worldview. It's like, well, if we actually do something to stop drag queen story hour, well then it's going to happen even more. There's going to be a black market for it. And then, uh, then it's going to happen even more. So we can't actually do something to stop it. <laughs> That's what it's like with the Red Scare rhetoric. It's like that, you know, somehow that actually, like, you know, stopping communists uh, from spreading propaganda in the 50s. Well, that's actually what caused it. It's complete nonsense. Hmm.
So I guess uh, maybe, you know, Settler might be right here. And we're, we're witnessing the events now that 20 years from now, you know, Hollywood will have created its own version of, and it's just going to be lost to history. And, and we're just going to be like James Burnham or something talking about it you now way after anyone even knows the real truth. But so how do we stop that from happening? I mean, is it alternative uh, media? Do we have to make our own versions of this story to, as an alternative to what they're going to be putting out? I mean, how do we how do we stop the same thing from happening with this as happened with the communists and the Red Scare? Well, not only that, but I think that like the uh, the entire narrative around civil rights is complete bullshit. But uh, it's been told to the last two generations completely through Hollywood, and that's the, that's what's become the history in in the minds of the public. I mean, uh, I don't think I don't think it reflects reality. But um, what the, what you what they could end up doing is what they could end, what they'll do is they'll make like a film about Black Lives Matter, which um, is just propaganda that is designed to um, put put uh, in people's mind a uh, favorable um, historical perception of Black Lives Matter twenty years from now. And, that, that, and that's you know assuming that this stuff goes on, which hopefully by by then this is all uh, all this nonsense is gone. But that's what they'll end up doing. They'll end up making, uh, they'll end up rewriting the history books and making uh, propaganda, which presents uh, Black Lives Matter in a positive light today, just like they've done with the civil rights movement. And that'll become the, uh, that'll become the, uh, the, the image in the minds of the public of what's going on right now. Well, this is the problem though, Endeavor, is that uh, the difficulty is not that civil rights is the favorite story of the establishment. It, has been the favorite story of the establishment now for about 50 years. And it's been officially the favorite story of Hollywood for the last 25. The problem is, is that I believe after this point, after the point we are in right now, I don't think the establishment has a story other than civil rights to say, to tell any other story detracts from the civil rights story. So we could be in the single story state. Ah. Uh. Yeah, this could be this could be the transition from a two story state to a single story state. Oh uh, yeah, didn't I see you were going to do a stream about that tomorrow? E yeah, kind of. I mean, I'm, I think it's on Tuesday, but I'm I was planning a, I was planning to talk about that a little bit on a general live stream. Mm. Uh, but but maybe maybe I should have made a video on it. But this was sort of the uh, the Mulbuggian concept is that most advanced states are two story states. Mm, but, yeah, you know, I didn't anyway. think about that, but you but, might but, be right. Yeah, I mean, so so the story, the America's two-story state was civil rights, and then the Constitution was the other story, right? And so in every one of our interactions in the culture war for the past six years, it's been the Constitution versus civil rights. And then, you know, every single time, or most of the time, most of the time before 2012, and every time after 2012, uh, civil rights won. Uh, after this constitutional law and order, I don't know if that's going to be a story outside of a few weird minority communities. Black Lives Matter does not have room in itself for a story about the Constitution and law and order and us being a nation. It only has room in it for we're the next civil rights movement. So mm -hmm. the question is, once everybody has now pledge fealty to Black Lives Matter. Is there anyone mature enough to know that they need to have subtlety? Or is it just going to be a single story state? Do you think though that that the hypocrisy is actually going to reveal itself to, to the normal to the average normie? Because you know they can portray something like you know the 1968 race riots, which of course were um were actually institutionally backed back then. But at least that was like hard to actually see. Like that was that was uh, no no one on the surface knew that that was the case back then. And even it's hard to it's hard to see that today. But you know, when every single Fortune 500 company is coming out in defense of Black Lives Matter, every single uh, elected politician, every single institution of any kind uh, is coming out in full support. And anyone who doesn't, like say Drew Brees, for example, just gets instantly crushed into submission, where they have no choice but to give into it. Do you think that like hypocrisy is actually going to reveal itself to the average person? Or well, long enough, I frame, yes. Sorry. On a long enough time frame, yes, it's like a slow oil leak. And the but the more mature, the more mature leaders are at the helm, they can keep that oil leak from widening out and destroying the whole system. If it's a bunch of ideologues 
they could have a serious problem on their hands. Because, like, you know, say say 2012, like when they, when they they talk about say I don't know white supremacy or something like that, they can point to the Republican Party or the Tea Party or something like that. But like, what are they even pointing to now? Like some what, like one cop in Minneapolis. Like, I, I, where is this so-called white privilege that they're referring to? And it's like, uh, how do they actually point to something like that and claim that it's still, it's still like that? That's actually what's in power today. Like, uh, to me, it, it's just, com it's just completely, uh, it, it's just hard to actually legitimize them as the underdog. I mean, right now they're pointing at ghosts. They're pointing at institutionalized racism, even though every single institution, I mean, they're, if they're institutionally racist, they're institutionally anti-white. That's the truth. The but like those pointing to, for sure. Like this is like, the, they're, they're pointing to like this, this like uh, fake, like uh, invisible um, entity of whiteness or something like that. That's just supposedly just like in the air in Western society. And it's like, uh, how, how, how long can they actually hold up the, the facade that, um, that their ideology is not the one with absolute power? I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I think a decent analogy might be how many normal people realized in the newest Star Wars trilogy that the resistance was obviously the establishment by the universe's own rules. And I mean, a lot of people, I hear that criticism a lot, but is it most people? I mean, a, a, my boomer family members didn't realize that. Uh, a lot of people, they, it, it can be, it's that blatant and people just don't realize it. They the faction that's portrayed as the rebels, even when they blatantly control everything, are just still believed to be the rebels. Hmm. I mean, it's a question of money and leadership. Hypocrisy eventually outs itself, lies eventually out themselves. But it takes energy and money to cover it up. In 1968, when you're pointing to these things endeavor, and I also don't. I also don't think that you know. This is the thing, and, and I'm going to say this, and this is probably might be a bit controversial. But I mean, and, you know, it's not just elites lying, right? The the problem was there was also a certain amount of decadence in the general population. Uh, the reason why this all sort of came to head in the '70s was, in in a lot of ways, you know, the boomers weren't the heirs of the the greatest generation or or the the lost generation. Uh, they've been handed a lot of things and a lot in a, in a whole world on a platter in a way that their parents and grandparents just hadn't been. And, and because of that, uh, the kind of narrative that their parents and grandparents were telling them about America, it wasn't really true. It wasn't like, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. A lot of them hadn't. And so when when that reality, you know, uh, you know, in the 1920s, a lot of Americans had just pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. And there, there was there was, it was a different reality back then, and so, and I guess what I'm saying is, but but in 1968, you know, there was sort of a decadent new generation, and America was very rich, and they had a lot of very very competent leaders. I am not so sure if that's the case anymore. I think that the, the young leaders we have now are corrupt to the core, and I think that they are. Um, they're they're not going to have they don't have the money to cover this all up continuously and they don't have the patience or the leadership to understand what they're even doing they they they, they started they, they've done the classic mistake that all leaders do they started believing their own bullshit not just believing their own lies believing their own bullshit and there's a difference yeah i i, I mean yeah i just wonder like uh Will the hypo uh, will people act it actually get through to people the reality of who's actually in power today? The reason I wonder that is like I just look at my Facebook and then all these like normies who I used to know when I from back when I lived in Toronto they're all posting this Black Lives Matter bullshit on their Facebook and it's like they they do, they honestly don't realize that either they don't realize or they're just they're just uh, they're just brainwashed that they are the establishment. This this view has absolute institutional control across the Western world. And it doesn't seem to dawn on a lot of them. It, it, it will eventually sink in. I think the, the, the space opens up for it once the, the two stories merge into one. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's that's basically what Moldbug writes about in this this first clear p pill essay. I, I've been looking at it for the for the past few minutes and I, I think uh I think Dave might have actually stumbled on like the key observation in terms of how we're supposed to view what, what Moldbug wrote here. Cause I mean, I remember, I think Sedler and I did a stream on this and we weren't exactly sure 
what to make of it. But um, I think that we may actually be seeing the 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 two story state um, enter its transition transition phase where it actually becomes a one story state. Right. Um, I mean, like, how do you believe in my constitution and law and order after this? If you're a conservative. Like you've been house arrested for three months on zero pretenses, and then they let Blue America out to burn to burn everything down. <laughs> yeah, what, the point I, I made this point on uh, Jake's and Latte's channel was that we're essentially in the early the first half of 2020, and I'm sorry that we can get back to the uh, the subject yeah. of left, the left in fiction. But the point I had made was that uh, we've seen the two uh, extreme ends of anarcho tyranny in the early half of the, of 2020. We've seen uh, mothers getting thrown in jail for taking their children to the park. We've seen the police firing at people, uh, firing rubber bullets at people for standing on their porch. Um, and we've seen like, you know, people denied the right to go to their own uh, family member's funeral. But then we've also seen just like a couple of weeks later, we see a mayor of a, of a um, city basically yield an entire section. We've seen this multiple times. We've seen in uh, Minneapolis, the mayor tell uh, the police force to stand down against rioters burning down uh, several city blocks. We've seen a mayor in um, in uh, Seattle or not Seattle, uh, Portland, uh, yield in, like several city blocks to these uh, an these anarcho communist, uh, um, you know, LARPing revolutionaries or something like that. We've just seen a, the, the complete. Uh, we've seen the absolute anar anarchy in the last few weeks. When before that, we saw the absolute tyranny. And it's just like uh, um, you, you basically just see liberalism, everything that's supposedly good about liberalism, everything that's supposedly good about, I mean, like classic liberalism, the rule of law. Well, we've seen rule of law go completely out the window. What's this Shaz thing? That's not rule of law. Um, and we've, see, we've seen rule of law go out the window. And then we've also seen individual rights go out the window with the uh, uh, coronavirus lockdown. So like basically the, uh, like you mentioned, the my constitution it's just completely ineffective in any way, shape, or form today. The two components of the red state story have now died in 2012, or 2020, I should say. Uh, I don't know how any rational person experientially can believe the red America story anymore. Yeah, I, I wonder how many people are actually aware of what's actually going on in terms of the things dispelling that story. Like, uh, how like are the people in these red states are they aware of what's actually going on in the the rest of the country or are they just sort of still in their bubble i think that's the real question and and barrier we have to break through in order to come up with some sort of viable third story um because you know i guess the main avenue we have for this sort of thing, right, is someone like Tucker Carlson. I mean, he's kind of one of the main people we would rely on to actually expose people in these red states to what's going on. Um, but I don't actually know how many people are are being being made aware of it through him. And and even you know through him, you're, you're still only getting a small slice of of the absurdity, right? Yeah, I don't know if any of you guys are fans of the NFL. And I guess this kind of go, goes in with entertainment, even though it's not it's not really fiction, it's sports. But uh, if you remember from a couple of years ago, the take a knee thing, that started with Colin Kaepernick. Who yeah. was, uh, he, he, was a, he was a quarterback. He was good for like two seasons. He uh, basically declined rapidly in skill. He became a really lousy quarterback. I think he was even benched. Uh, and, he, that, and in his last season in the NFL, he started the take a knee protest. And this is when he was already long past his uh, brief – moment of, of success uh, professionally. Um, and basically the, the league was against, uh, the, the league, uh, the fans at least were strongly against the take a knee protest. Uh, and it was something that was controversial uh, for the first, um, uh, the, the first season that happened. Then the, sec the second season, it became, the, the, the protest became more popular, but it came, became even more unpopular with the fans. Like you saw, um, you saw some games where, uh, the entire team would kneel and then the fans would boo their own team for the entirety of the national anthem. And the NFL basically realized that this is tanking our numbers. Uh, it's making people less uh, uh, enjoy our games less. We, uh, they don't want politics in their sports. And uh, overall, it was bad for them. And uh, they decided to, to scrap the entire thing. They decided, you know, we're going to just get rid of this whole like take a knee protest. We don't we don't want it. Uh, 
in our um, we don't want it in our sport because the fans hate it and it's tanking our numbers. But the NFL has completely capitulated to that. So they've completely capitulated to uh, the Black Lives Matter movement against what is the, in their financial interest and against what their fans actually wanted. Because, you know, I mean, the, the NFL fan base, it is uh, it, it is it isn't like an entirely white fan base. The fan base is the diverse, but there is a large number of NFL fans who uh, are, you know, these white conservative guys um, and they're very patriotic. And, you know, that the take a knee uh, protest was like a kind of a slap in the face to them because, you know, I mean, I, I everyone who everyone who uh, anyone who's being honest knows that it's not about police brutality. It is just entirely an anti-white protest. And basically they're either, you know, watching their their weekly Sunday uh, football matchup and they're being told that like they're a horrible person for being for being white and they just hated it. But now the NFL in the last couple of weeks has capitulated. So. I mentioned earlier that Drew Brees actually said. I mean, everyone takes a knee now. Yeah, now it's going to be the entire the entire league. Like Drew Brees said uh, that uh, he wasn't going to take a knee. The fans are, or the fans are, or it's like up to them. No, no. Well, what do you mean? Is it up to them? I I don't know. I mean, it just. I mean, who? who, If everyone's doing it, who is the protest against? Why? Why even play the national (laughs) anthem at the end? You know. The events, right? I mean, like, isn't the idea that you're taking a knee to protest other people who are honoring the national anthem to, to yeah. indicate that they're not doing enough to stop this problem? But it, without people standing, then the the individuality of the protest loses its meaning. It just means that we're doing another gesture, or are we going to get rid of the entire thing? I mean, that make, makes more sense to get rid of the entire thing. Right? Well, it, what was interesting was that uh, you well, you saw that Drew Brees had actually said he was not going to kneel, and maybe Charlemagne might know a bit more about this since he's uh, from uh, he's from the South. But uh, um, Drew Brees was like a hero in New in New Orleans. He had done so much for that city. He had uh, gone to that team after the the after Hurricane Katrina had completely destroyed New Orleans as a city, and you know he he basically sa- he saved the team and brought them back into. Uh, made them a competitive team again and won them a championship. And uh, what you saw is his own teammates basically telling him uh, to screw off on social media because he said he was not going to participate in the take a knee campaign. And uh, you even saw like, you know, uh, a lot of the uh, people, a lot of the BLM protesters like chanting fuck Drew Brees uh, at the protests in New Orleans. And uh, he basically had, he had, he had to capitulate himself. He had to come out and like issue like four different apologies because he just dared to take a stand against BLM. And uh, he and I mean, let's be honest here. He doesn't actually uh, support this. He just realized that, you know, he has no other choice because the entire league has uh, gotten behind the BLM protests, which only a couple of years ago was disastrous for their for their uh, numbers because their fans absolutely hated it. But they've sided with uh the intelligentsia and of BLM above the interest of the, their own fan base, really. Yeah. Um, you make an interesting point there. I mean, if people don't know much about the NFL, they won't realize this, but like, you know, Drew Brees is well known as a philanthropist, uh, mostly for uh, what you'd call progressive causes. And that's kind of one of the most interesting things about this is that's all just kind of ignored, right? Um, it doesn't really matter what you do, especially if you're a white male. Uh, if you, if you don't toe the line exactly, as they want, uh, your past doesn't matter at all. You're going to be forced to submit uh, no matter who you are. Um, one of the interesting things about that is that I think this actually ties into the, the clear, p- clear pill essay um, because w- one of the things Moldbug points out in terms of the, um, the, the way to succeed with a third story is to aim at rogue gentry, right? Uh, or rogue elites. And elites like Drew Brees um, or not necessarily exactly him, but people like him who get sort of burned by the left, even when they're, they're trying to comply with them. I think those are the type of rogue elites that are worth aiming after, you know, to, to show them that there's, there's, there's money in siding with the, the right side. And there, there's, there's, you know, influence and you won't simply be thrown under the bus because you didn't um, display some sort of ideological perfection. Um, that's he, how we need to be thinking. Was he real? Was he a progressive? Because I, I always thought of Drew Brees as kind of like this all-American. Uh, he is, yeah, he is. But, guy. but, but you know, he he's definitely all-American. But he, he's a philanthropist, basically, and you know, a lot of that money goes to you know, 
NGOs that are inevitably left wing, right? Uh, as as most of them tend to be. So it's not that he's sort of pro progressivism per se. It's just that he donates a lot lots of money to these uh, causes through the NGOs, and but but despite doing that, he still gets thrown under the bus, right? Even though he's given more to these NGOs than they could ever really reasonably ask for. Yeah, and I mean, uh, I, I guess one thing to kind of tie it back into uh, the topic of fiction and of uh, left-wing fiction, it's like, the, it's that, um, you know, you, you do kind of need some, you, I, th I think that one of the things that is key to actually creating that uh, third narrative or, you know, a new narrative to replace the one narrative that's kind of, that's being forced on us now is you do need to have uh, some kind of uh, art and entertainment to actually facilitate that, to actually get that message out there. And I mean, of course, that's easier said than done because we don't control Hollywood. But, um, you know, I, I do think that uh, I, I do think that kind of more right wing entertainment, even if it's kind of only made by uh, even if it's unintentional, is going to just be more successful. Like, look at how successful something like 1917 was. And really, I mean, it's it's not like super right wing. And they did they did try to sneak in a lot of the. Uh, of the propaganda into 1917 with the, you know, the fake diversity and stuff like that. But ultimately what it is, is just a, a story about European soldiers fighting on the Western front in uh, world war one. And that's something that, that was actually fresh in comparison to just the complete rubbish that's being churned out by Hollywood today. And I think that there's a real opportunity there because, you know, we don't, you know, we, we, like conservative entertainment has been, very low quality uh, for a long time. I mean, maybe not as much recently, but I think of things like in the eighties, like, uh, like uh, red dawn or something like that. It's, I mean, it's a really low quality film. Uh, and there, there, there's just like such a, there's a lot, a lot more of an opportunity now. And, you know, you're, you're going to see less of that because they, because Hollywood knows that they need to keep the propaganda machine going. But I do think that there's going to be a bigger, uh, a bigger market for right wing ideas in in uh, entertainment. Yeah, um, I, I would like to read some super chats now. Um, we've gone a few. Um, so uh, Paul Cornelius for $5 says, you guys are streaming while Michael Malice and Moldbug are streaming. Uh, that's true. You all should check that out after, not now, afterwards. Um, uh, then the 21st violinist said, any change, any change of plans based on current degradation? Uh, yes. Anyone have anything to say for that? I mean, that's kind of vague. Yes. Uh, yes, I, I, yes. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, I don't, yeah, I don't know what to say to that. Um, it's, yeah. it's too vague. Yeah. I, mean, um, um, I, I, I would say, I wouldn't say change of plans, but this is reinforced the get out of the city um, idea. I mean, just don't live in cities, live as, as far away from them as you can. Um, that's kind of been my plan anyway, but I might act it out sooner now. Uh, and not Omegon for two dollars. Uh, have any of you read Mine Were the Trouble? Mine Were of Trouble. Uh, I've never heard of that. Have any of nope. you guys? I'll Google it. Okay. Uh, Mine Were of Trouble. Uh, and Emmett for five dollars. How do we get the right to stop watching anime? Anime sucks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Imperial this question. <laughs> I, I, well, I, I, my now, uh, not my now, uh, deceased Discord server, I banned anime from it. So that was my, that was my attempt to get the right to stop watching anime. I think we need I, to hit an F for Discord. I think we all, do we all, everyone get nuked off of that platform? Yeah. We're uh, all I'm, four I'm of us banned. Uh, yeah. This is the banned Discord crew, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I'm still, a, I'm, uh, they never banned me. Oh, oh, they're, we're the one that got away. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, my uh, my Discord's still around. If anyone wants to join that. Um, <laughs> speaking of getting away from the cities, you know you need to get off that platform. Like, you know, I mean, you can't. I, I, I do. I mean, I do think we need an alternative where we're not going to lose our entire contact list. Yeah. But I, I, I do think um, I, I, I do think it is useful to still maintain uh, uh, to still be on places like Discord um, because that is where we can get access to. Uh, to a lot more people like w w whatever alternative we end up using is going to have a much more limited um user base i mean at, at worst you could just hang out and like 
you could hang out in like Sargon server or something, right? If you can, I, I do do that. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it, I, I mean, you know, it, I, 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 I do think it's. We do definitely need an alternative, but I do think it's still useful for at least some of us to hang around on Discord for as long as possible. Um, and uh, and yes, banning anime is probably the easiest way to get rid of it. Uh, I, though um, I, I did see another comment when that Super Chat was first posted that said uh, the best way of getting rid of anime is for uh, Western uh, fiction to make Western fiction that is better. Um, and um, I, I think there's probably some truth in that, just in the fact that uh, in anime, you're not going to get the sort of uh, anti-white tropes that you get, and you're, you're not going to, you're going to get something that at least uh, uh, promotes Western tradition a little bit sometimes, even if they don't understand what they're doing. Um, but that, that that's a you know, different topic. Um, yes, and, and one last message. Um, this is from a donor who asked me to read something. Um, and for five dollars, uh, he said, "Is leftist nihilism like Rick and Morty going to be completely replaced by the intersectional left, or will it always stay?" I think I think they're compatible. A large yeah, they're very compatible. Have you have you guys been watching? Have you guys been watching the fate of people like the like basically the Amazing Atheist or or Jake and? Jake and Hugo, now Jake and Hanna, it, it, all of the nihilistic atheist people, they've all they've all gone full bore onto the progressive bandwagon. And so this is uh this is uh the nihilistic new atheist stuff is totally compatible with SJWism. If you don't care about the future, then it's compatible with what they want. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, uh, you know, it's really. Um, it, I, I know. I, I just think. I just think of someone like T.J. Kirk, and like that. that like it's just he. He embodies like someone that just doesn't care about the future, and then ha and just has no. Uh, it, it just just has no stake in anything that's happening, and so why why not? Why isn't that compatible with progressivism? Progressivism is designed to destroy society. He couldn't care less, and it's the path of least resistance. So you know, if you, if you're the, this one kind of like. Uh, nihilist if you're not this nihilist type um who doesn't care about the future that's the path of least resistance like it's it's easy to be an sjw all you have to do is just like uh uh spit out a few platitudes about white people need to they need to learn about their privilege and then you're uh you're in that then you're you know socially acceptable by the mainstream yeah it um i mean i imagine what pseudo was trying to get at with that question um, is that they, they shouldn't be, they, they shouldn't be, uh, they shouldn't be compatible in a intellectual sense. Um, you know, the idea that racism is the worst thing ever and it absolutely needs to, we need, you know, to focus all of society towards destroying it. And the idea that nothing matters, like th those don't logically fit together. Um, but they do because, uh, nihilism is a tactic. It's just used to break down things they don't like. It's not actually something they seriously believe in. Yes. Yeah, exactly. It's so, it's so that like you don't care about uh, your your society falling apart. So you know they'll apply the nihilism to any like right winger who believes in tradition or believes in uh, in hierarchy or anything that any who who wants to preserve anything of value. The nihilism is to uh, is designed to deconstruct uh, any form of conservatism that like uh, actually caring about anything. That's uh, that's cringe, or that's lame, or something like that, or uh, or it's low brow, it's unintelligent too. But then you know they they're they're cowards, so they don't they when when applying that to the left, they receive like actual pun they actually receive punishment and pushback from the cathedral. So for someone who's like as lazy and uh, intellectually uninterested as T.J. Kirk, for him it's just easy to just give into that because and you know just go on about more like you know cringe. Uh, cringe Christians uh, are dumb because they believe in Jeebus or something like that. It's just much easier uh, to just give in to the zeitgeist because, you know, it's somebody who just doesn't care. They'll take the path of least resistance. I, I There's some, one group, there's one community I could snap out of existence. It's the I, nihilistic new atheists, the people who are 100% on the uh, 
progressive bandwagon, but are still, but they're they're still they they don't have any progressive values really either. They just want to sit back and consume product and get excited for a new product. And they have all of these opinions that are just copy pasted from Christopher Hitchens, and all they want to do is just consume shit. I, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. I don't understand how any young men can find that. I guess any young men over the age of twenty five could find that a lifestyle they wanted to pursue. But I guess some people just never get over it. One of the interesting things about that is is this sort of nihilism extends way beyond outside of even that community per se, and just to like into the general discourse of of normies all over the place, even ones who aren't explicitly progressive. I mean, I see this libertarians, libertarians all the time. I just mean like normal people. Like I, I, I see this all the time in the discord I have with my friends. Like I have this one friend who's, who's not very like comedic and he's probably the most progressive person in there. And whenever something political will happen, you know, like what's going on now, conversations will start happening and, and he's asking serious questions and all of the other guys start deploying sort of nihilistic attitudes or ironic attitudes and he can't actually tell when they're being serious or not. So you just get these sham conversations that have so much, so many layers of irony on top of them that it becomes impossible for anyone to even determine what position anyone actually believes in anymore. And I find that this, this is kind of just what you see now in culture generally. Like when I just talk to other millennials, um, even if they criticize the whole consumer of product culture, they they kind of just are that anyway. Um, and whenever they, whenever you try to have any serious discussion with them about anything, even if they're not left wing, um, all dialogue is just infested with this, this toxic nihilism and irony that just poisons everything and makes it impossible to get two steps into a serious discussion. Yeah, um, I've, I've noticed the same thing, and, and it, it really is in the it, it really is in the culture uh, a, as a whole. It's really pushed by. I think of things like Big Bang Theory, and that's really the kind of world. That's really the kind of worldview that's pushed by a show like Big Bang Theory. And I was never a fan of it. I've only seen a few episodes, but it's about essentially like these bug men who they they live for I don't know settlers of Catan or I don't know uh, Marvel or whatever 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 it is, but. Um, yeah, I, I kind of find that that uh, attitude is something that is really the culture is really seeped in, and like that's the kind of like thing that things that are like uh, uh, that are um, presented as humorous. Those are the kind of things that like that that's what that's what's presented as being like funny or being uh, witty or something like that. But um, yeah, it, it really um, to me it's just empty. I so I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if there actually are people out there that are looking for something genuine and uh, kind of an escape from the irony culture. But um, uh, yeah, they definitely you definitely see that in a lot of uh, a lot of entertainment today. I've never seen like I've never seen the show Rick and Morty. Is that one still popular, or did it kind of? I, I think it's kind of died off, but there's always something that replaces it, right? It's it's Rick and Morty today, and it's. I don't know, probably something else now. Who knows? And, and, you know, the thing is like, that, that I can't stand about it is that like the people that uh, kind of buy into that, they, 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 they think that they're such like rebels by doing it. They think it's like, it makes you like so high IQ and it's so uh, high brow to just be like a nihilist. But then, I mean, it's really, it's really not. It's really, it, you know, they, it just comes across as like so pretentious these days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because like the people I'm talking about uh, that I know in real life, they're they're not even nihilists. It's like they don't eat, or they're nihilists, but they don't realize it. That's one. Of, it's it's so strange because people sort of take these basic progressive attitudes without identifying as progressive, or they they deploy this irony and, and nihilism without actually viewing themselves as nihilists. Like that that's how much it's it's pervasive in the culture now that people don't even realize that they're they're living out this this uh nihilist way of thinking about things and they, they don't even understand how toxic it is to, to just conversation like i watch these conversations happen and it's it's actually a non-conversation just because of the the layers of irony and, and they just don't even realize how destructive it actually is it's like they're not even doing it on purpose right they're not doing it to be you know edgy boys or something it just it's how they communicate yeah, it kind of makes it like that, that actually saying anything of value is uh, you're reluctant to actually say anything of value because 
then it actually, actually, uh, actually believing in something unironically is like cringe or whatever. So, you know, if you actually like, uh, if you actually like try to like, for, like, for, for example, one of the, one of the things that I've, I've encountered is that when I've told people I, I'm a Christian before, I, they've actually like thought I was joking. Like they couldn't believe that, you know, I actually uh, believed in it. I, I was actually religious. I actually believed in something higher than just uh, pure nihilism. And that like, uh, it, it just feels like, you know, you, you have to like, it, it's almost impossible to actually take anything seriously through uh, the lens of just uh, pure irony, really. Uh, Greg Johnson did a, did a fantastic uh, speech on uh, the problems of, of irony uh, in regards to things like identity and of, of right wing movements that eventually you need something that it, that you unironically stand for and that it's not a joke to you that you actually uh, you, you actually stand for that. Like, you know, you can take the example of the uh, Islamic extremist like the. Um, the, the, the Muslim in the Middle East, uh, the guy who joins, you know, things like ISIS or something like that, he doesn't care. So like if someone, if, if Richard Dawkins went up to him and, and, and talked about like, you know, Sky Fairy and, oh, uh, you know, it's not real. And uh, you believe in, uh, in, in uh, this flying spaghetti monster or something like that. The, the Muslim doesn't care. He just behead him and, uh, and go on with his day because um, he holds, uh, he unironically holds those beliefs. And I do think that, you know, I'm obviously not saying that they, we need to go, we need to be that, that radical, but eventually I think you do need a right that just does not care about things like irony, uh, that they, that we actually hold these values. Um, it, it, and, uh, we, 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 un, we unironically and, and truly actually hold things as, as valuable. Um, and, yeah. and you can't you can't just deconstruct that like morgoth did a great video on um the the gen x on the irony of the gen xers and it was this video of the these uh this 18 year old right wing guy debating these uh these um like like guys in their late 30s who were progressives and they did this like ridiculous batman skit where like one of them came on camera dressed as batman and said like he's gonna find he's gonna find you Nazi punks and punch you and he did like the Christian Bale Batman voice and it was just completely like pathetic it, it was just so cringeworthy um, and, and that uh, you know the the young guy came out completely on top just by actually standing up for something unironically and uh, you know it's actually taking the real problems of the world uh, ser taking them seriously. Um, and yeah, I think I think that like one of the things that the right can uh, can act one of the things that we can actually do is actually um, unironic uh, stand up for things unironically. It's kind of like the antidote to irony. So, uh, we need to actually have something that we can offer people that is completely uh, genuine and that uh, that they that you know it's not cringe to actually care about. Yeah, I I think this is a good way to actually pose a, a third story that is outside of, of the two story state as it is now that can actually work. Um, because, you know, one of the responses I often get from my friends when I talk about this stuff is, is that, okay, well, sure. All this is happening, but Hey, we're comfortable and have air conditioning and food, but it's like, how much longer is that argument going to hold up at this point? You know, even, even if you took that as valid when, you know, at this point there's, you know, rioting in all these places like there are plenty of people now who uh who that doesn't work for anymore right and their their cities are, are being burned down and and you know they don't have jobs anymore they lost them because of coronavirus. yeah and coronavirus right like so this this argument is going to stop working uh on people and and they're going to start looking for something real and, and and we can be there uh with something actually real and and just never you know i, I try to never do the irony anymore you know um it, it's 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 just so pervasive. It's like, I think people just cannot, they don't actually understand that people can have legitimate like beliefs based on some higher order principle that is, is great of greater value than themselves. Like even with my friends who aren't particularly progressive, like I can, you know, I can, I could literally rant about the bankers who control the media uh, in front of them. Right. And they'll, they'll laugh with me but at the same time whenever I try to I try to express like conviction then the the irony and nihilism comes out in this oh we're just comfortable type of thing and I think it's really because they they just don't actually comprehend thinking outside of like 
their small sphere and that there are thing things much greater than us that that really matter and that's that's what we just have to cut through with with pure sincerity and i think eventually that will work as this this oh we're just comfortable story falls apart around people Do you want to, uh, either of you guys want to uh, add to that? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it was summed up pretty well. But yeah, it's, uh, I mean, you know, I, I can't even count how many times I've had, I've like, you know, mentioned people, like you said, that I'm a Christian um, and had them say, oh, like, you don't really believe in that though, right? Um, and it, it's, I don't know, it's just exhausting. Um, and and that, that that is how they, really feel they they don't understand how you could believe something you know how you could like believe in god when that's what almost everyone has believed in for all of human history um because that that's just how strong the overwhelming cultural force against that is now yeah i think another thing that another problem with irony is it actually makes like uh relationships a lot more difficult to form yeah. because yeah. um it, like like for what well, for example like like uh, um I, I forget who it was that said this but like um uh, I think it, I think it was on one of the academic one of the academic agents videos, but you know, like uh, if somebody had like um, if if if, you, if your entire like uh, persona is completely ironic, it's important it's impossible to actually like uh, portray genuine uh, feelings towards another person um, because you know that it's always met with like completely like, insincerity. But eventually, I think like you know, in, in terms of like relationships with someone, someone that you actually. Uh, care about and you and you want a future with that's something that's not ironic it's not a joke um you actually have to uh that's something you actually have to commit to but kind of the the um the tone of irony really makes it impossible for people to really connect on a uh on a uh, on a deeper level and it just makes it so it, it just makes it so much more difficult to actually feel like you know have genuine human experiences with another person and to actually form a uh, relationship with someone that you know you uh, that you want in, that you maybe even want to marry in the future. Uh, I think I think like irony is something that's very destructive to um, to uh, that to that process to the um, the process of um, courtship and uh, uh, relationships and eventual marriage. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the irony. Well, I don't want to say one of the ironies. One of the contradictions. One of the contradictions is that you know the. Uh, whole like irony culture it's meant to be like something that uh you just indulge in absolute like uh hedonism and stuff like that but the the, the reality is that um it uh it, it often actually robs you of a lot of the things that uh it, it actually robs you of a lot of a lot of things like genuine relationships and it, it robs you of a lot of things that are genuinely enjoyable for people because uh, you never you're not ever able to actually connect on a in a uh more uh, authentic manner. I think though, I guess I, what I'm trying to push back on a little bit right now is sort of, I think that 2020 has accelerated a lot of things. I'm not gonna lie about that, but it also has gotten the right really, really addicted to collapsism. And I, I don't think that we should be thinking that way so much. I think that, you know, we, everyone have a contingency plan. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but you know, the conversation is going to go on. I don't think we're as close to collapse as people say we are. Uh, I think that we need to have a continue. I don't, I think we have a, we need to be able to sort of adopt to the conversation that comes out of this thing. And I'm not saying accept it because the conversation that comes out of 2020 is going to be absolutely nuts, but we have to have a way of interacting with it somehow. So I'll say that is I, I'm not so 100% sold on like, okay, collapse now. I think we need to think a little bit more about, you know, this narrative well, is going into a mode where it's unsustainable, but that just means that we need to have new narratives that are better. Yeah. We're not ready for it. We're not ready for collapse to come. No. Yeah. I know. And there was a, there is a video and, and I never get his name right. And, and then, and then I see this Anamnesis. and enemy. Okay. Well, you got it. Um, <laughs> He he did he did, uh, he did a review of a essay I read about I read from Moldbuck a very long time ago and I forgot it even existed about like a really really bad piece of poetry that was given all of these awards and uh, 
that really has no quality to it. And you know, Mole Bug dissects it and he dissects the power systems that create this bad piece of poetry. Uh, but the problem is, and I think everyone knows this, is that uh, you know, no no culture was ever brought about by pointing out how bad poetry came about. Uh, it comes about by making good poetry and making people who consume good poetry. Yeah. Or you know, whatever else you're talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing I actually, uh, I also noticed was just kind of in uh, in line with the left and, the, and fiction. And I think you guys would probably know more about this than I would because I, I, one of the big differences between Dave and I is I can't stomach bread tube. But uh, any, the, the things that I've, uh, that I've watched from them, like I've watched a few, uh, saying you're not a big Joel fan, Dever. You don't you don't uh, like Big Joel? Uh, no, I I, I, I don't. Uh, I I think I could pass on Big Joel, but um, he's so uh, genuine. Like, His eyes are so big when he looks into the camera. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, thing I, the thing I I was wondering though is because I watched a few of uh, like not even entire videos, but a few things from like Lin, from Lindsay Ellis, mm -hmm. and it just seems like their takes on culture is so bad. Like their takes are just uh, Lindsay Ellis. Particular is really tired. Lindsay Ellis is essentially doing like, I wish the two thousand to two thousand. I wish the two thousand and three to two thousand and twelve America was still here, so I could be relevant again. I mean, her understanding of that period is terrible. I'm I'm going to do a response video just to that. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I actually used to watch Nostalgia Critic, which looking back on that, that that was really lame. But um, I mean, it was funny. But but the, the, beside the point, like the, their takes on culture is so bad. Like I find that with them. The only two takes they have are that I like this this uh, movie, film, book because it's about racism, sexism, or homophobia, or mm -hmm. I don't like this film, book, or uh, TV show because it's racist, sexist, or homophobic. Like they, they have no. Um, it just seems like they can't understand culture th throughout just such a like narrow ideology. Now I don't want to say like you know we don't do the same thing. We we don't. Uh, look at, at things through ideology like of course we do I, I do that on my channel all the time but i feel like there's actually like a lot more first of all a lot more nuance and there's uh, like a lot more actually said about the world like um but with, with with these bread tubers it's just it's intersectionality it's always is this film racist sexist or homophobic if it is it's bad is it against racism sexism and homophobia if so then it's good it just seems like they have nothing interesting to say about culture today it's always this oppression narrative and there's nothing else Mm. Yeah, the 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 issue isn't whether or not the media the media is political. The issue is they they generally aren't trying to explore deep philosophical questions, which are political, which are also political questions. They're just trying to say racism is bad and you shouldn't be racist, and well, that, that, that's there, basically where most of their where most of the moral questions they look at come down to. There is a fundamental psychological question here. I think Lindsay Ellis knows that her takes are kind of getting tired. I can I feel like I can hear it in her voice. I know that's her shtick, but I, I feel like I can hear her own self-exhaustion in her voice. The more interesting cases, I think, are people like Innuendo Studios. Uh, he really well, even, He's even worse. Like, his I know, is just entirely just, I this know, is racist. This is sexist. He, he released a video about, um, what's it, uh, Guillermo del Toro's movies. And he comes out and says, like, everyone at Guillermo del Toro's movies is exactly the same. <laughs> and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> he, he straight out says it and he says he, he loves it because it's a predictable political formula and he made an entire video um i think it was last month not not very long ago walking through how it, basically this director makes the same movie over this is the guy who did the shape of water in pan's labyrinth he makes the same movie over and over and over and over again and to anyone to studios he, this is just this is the greatest thing ever this is uh this is like hearing. This is like basically hearing a spiritual mantra over and over again. He talks about seeing the same movie over and over and over again, the same way that I would say, like, the the Eucharist is a consistent part of my religious practice, or at least it was before COVID. You know, like the the repetition is somehow spiritual to him. Yeah, and every every, every time he sees a new uh, Del Toro film come out, he, his mouth opens like the Bug Man meme. And like you know, tear my form on his eye, and you know, and. It, I, I don't know. I mean, I think there's some people who there's sort of two classes in this. And I think Lindsay Ellis and anyone to studios kind of mark the boundaries between these two types of people. They're the people who are, they're along for the ride. They know that this is right. They know that it's powerful. They're sold on the politics. 
uh, but they're they're not really sold on the religion. And then there's people like Inuendo Studios who's just he is on board with it as a religion. If he could see that same Guillermo del Toro movie where the evil white guy gets shown up by the minority kids every single day, he'd watch it every single day, and he would never have a second thought about it. They like there's, there's some a people, there's oh. some people who only need to have one story ever, right? It, I, I, yes, okay. yeah, go. No, no. Uh, well, what I, okay. What I was going to say was that there's a channel called the Pop Culture Detective. Do you, any of you guys know yeah. that channel? Well, that's the what's his name? That's John Macintosh's channel. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. The where Nia Sarkeesian's brain went after 2015, right? <laughs> because he made a video. Uh, someone sent me the, the, a video that from that channel on Wally after I had made my review of Wally, and I watched it. And his takes on the film were so bad. Like his takes was that his his um. What he said about the film was that the villain in Wally was a social system, and it's a social system just like white supremacy and patriarchy are social systems. So the the the, the message of Wally is that you know it's not people that are bad; it's social systems that are bad, and we can fight against social systems. I mean, like, just talk about like a a, a um, lack of understanding of uh, <laughs> of the of the film, but not only that, but th think of, like talk about something that's simplistic. Your, your, if your only take on it is it's a social system and social systems like white supremacy are bad, therefore intersectionality is correct. <laughs> it, it, I'm not going to lie. It really pisses me off. That, <laughs> that, line, it, that, that is, it's a very copy take. I'll take, I'll say that. I mean, like it's not untrue. It just kind of misses the interesting points about the movie. <laughs> it really pisses me off that my my video has like four thousand views and his has over a million. Yeah, yeah, God, it happens. But I mean, that's just that's just how these things are. I, uh, so I have to say, Settlers Lemon, I have to actually go now. Uh, but it's okay, been nice. Thanks, thanks for yeah, uh, thanks for joining us. Yeah, yeah. I uh, thanks. Ever, uh, we'll have to do this again sometime. It would be nice to have it be a regular thing. But I gotta um, get everyone ready for bed. So catch you guys later. Yeah, bye. Later. Yeah. Uh, someone, yes, yeah, so, uh, someone had sent me that video. It was real. it was really funny seeing, just seeing that, uh, I guess just like how bad his takes on the, on the film really are. I was considering doing like an, a, uh, bit shoot exclusive video where I, where I respond to his video, but I just find like they can't actually say anything about culture. That's interesting. Like not, not to like, not to, uh, you know, uh, not, not, not to toot my own horn, but like, you know, the, the videos I've done on that, I've, on things like that, like the Wally video, I talked about like its critique of modernity and of uh, uh, consu and of consumerism and of uh, kind of uh, uh, the, the future, the future that technology, that uh, mass consumption and technology will bring about. Whereas like say something like the Gettysburg video, I talked about things like masculinity and identity and uh, duty and honor. Like, it's completely different. It's both through the lens of right wing politics, but you know, it, they, they, it's just like it, it, there actually is like different things to say about the world. Uh, you know, you can look at, at uh, other right wingers who review films and there's actually interesting things to say about the world. It's not all just, you know, it, like it would be the equivalent if every single movie review was this movie says white people are great because this guy kicks this other guy's ass. And I like the movie like the, 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 with these left tubers. It's always just it's it, this film is racist. This film is bad because it's racist or this film is good because it's against racism. It's just so like uh, simplistic and just uh, it's so simplistic and just tired. And it's just obviously uh, the ideology is completely above any kind of uh, storytelling. Yeah. And the, the interesting thing about this is, is these reviews and such, they're mostly just kind of a circle jerk. Like they, they have a lot of views compared to us. Right. But it's still a tiny minority of the population that actually takes any of this stuff seriously. And I think the bigger problem is, the 10 times or a hundred times larger group of people that, that I've described a bit tonight where they're not even like on board with this stuff. They kind of just don't care, but they're kind of just on board with, I guess, like the light progressive direction of politics. And, and, th and they don't understand that this actually enables these radicals by, by just sort of gently going along with the current and not really standing against it. They don't realize the, 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 the implicit complicity in, in empowering these, anarcho tyrants basically because without this mass of people who are kind of just willing to go wherever the the current of progressivism goes uh in a in a slow manner but nevertheless progressing towards something uh, then these radicals would have nothing right because on their own 
they're they're still a very small minority, even though we're small ourselves, they are as well. Uh, but it's it's really the, the the problem that you know most most people just have this this lack of belief in anything that actually enables them to make the progress they do. Because if if there was any amount of, of mass sentiment that emerged against this stuff, it would be halted in its tracks. But it, it simply, you know, it, it can't happen in the nihilistic culture we have now. But I think we kind of already went over how to really break through that. Uh, yeah, uh, I got another super chat, so I'd like to read that out. Uh, Binks BB for five dollars said, "Devil's Advocate, what are your guys' favorite works of fiction by leftists?" I mean, basically all of them are leftists. So, uh, hmm. um, I will say that, like, um. It, there is a uh, there are some good leftist films. Like I'll admit, I did I did like Pan's Labyrinth. It's it it actually is genuinely a good film. Um, one like one that's uh one one film I actually really like is Oh Brother Where Art Thou? And and I mean it's a, it's an anti white film. There's there's no there's no doubt about it. I mean maybe Charlemagne might might dislike it a bit more since he's a southerner, but uh, um, I can't deny that it is a damn good film. It's a very it's very entertaining. I I, I see through the themes. But there are some there are some good leftist films. I mean, uh, I guess there's some that are, um, you know, you know, the, 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 the reason that their propaganda has been so effective is that it's been good it, for a lot for a long time. I guess the reason's wearing off now is that they're not making good propaganda anymore. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, you know, I, I still watch mainstream Hollywood movies every now and again, not too infrequently. Um, and they, you know, they are generally relatively enjoyable. Um, I don't know, I, you know, I might get cancelled for this, but I, I really loved Harry Potter growing up. Um, oh, and it's still, yeah, it still holds a special place in my heart for that. Um, and like you said, the aesthetics are really great, um, even if there's lots of other problems with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I read that the entire series like four times when I was in grade school. Hmm. For uh, me, I'm thinking more in terms of, uh, classic science fiction, maybe Asimov or something. Um, I don't know if you would call him a leftist per se, but uh, he certainly wasn't a right winger. Um, I don't know. I, I suppose I would probably enjoy the Game of Thrones novels, at least the first few, if I read them again. Um, I think they're fairly good, so I could go with that. Um, I don't know. Movies these days, I just kind of don't really care about it anymore. And I, I don't really feel like they hold a candle to a lot of older and better fiction you know like uh, i'm a star wars fan of course but i wouldn't say star wars is like my favorite work of fiction written by a leftist because it's 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 so small compared to something like uh foundation for example or i don't know the war of the worlds i'm not sure what hg wells's um political stance was though yeah i mean there there's there's there is there are there do exist good uh good films with with leftist themes uh I, I mean even star wars is something that is it's not far left i wouldn't say but it is left leaning uh, i mean at least like the original trilogy was it was definitely left leaning and you know i enjoyed it uh when i was young i, I was never a huge harry potter fan but i thought it, i thought you know it was kind of cool i i, I like like i mentioned i like the aesthetics of it uh, i didn't read the entire series i don't think i've even seen the, all the films but yeah i mean every young Every young person back in the early two thousands loved Harry Potter, um, but but yeah, I guess I guess the the reason that it's effective, like I said, it's because uh, they actually made good entertainment for a while. Mm. Yeah, I'm googling H. G. Wells now, and yeah, he was a socialist and member of the Fabian Society. So yeah, let's go with the War of the Worlds is my favorite fiction by leftists. Uh, so uh, does anyone have anything else they want to say, or do you want to wrap up now? I think that's a good place to stop. We talked about quite a bit. Unfortunately, we kind of got off the topic of entertainment a lot, but uh... no, I, I, yeah, I think the conversation was really good. Okay. Uh, yeah. So thank you everyone very much for watching. Uh, links are in the description for everyone's channel. If you aren't subscribed to everyone already, um, and especially subscribe to me because I'm me and I matter the most. Um, and uh, I'll probably be hanging around in discord and VC on discord after this. So feel free to join me. Anyone in chat, if you'd like to. Uh, bye.